is where we are here and the bus will come along here under the railway bridge when you're thinking about these routes that you know so well yeah the map here on the wall of the bus shelter do yeah. you have a map like that in your head is that what here you're reading here we go it comes at 209 if you travel on a bus with chris payne as a fellow passenger you really don't need a timetable. Oh yes, I know this driver. <laughs> if you're a bus driver, a little unsure of your route. Hello, how are you? He'll also be your map. Most times I leave home about four o'clock in the morning and I go over to Hammersmith, catch the 72 to Hammersmith. Chris's knowledge of Britain's and transport system N9. is encyclopedic. He throws to High Wycombe's the A40. From High Wycombe to Tame is the 305. From Tame to Oxford is the 2. Such a detailed fascination with a subject is typical of many autistic personalities. I catch another 70 from Swindon to Andover. And then I get a 76 from Andover. Six or seven, he started to run away. He ran to anything that would transport him. He's still crazy about transport now. So he'd run to the trains and he'd run to the buses. You'd turn your back and suddenly you'd look around and he'd gone. And 24 hours later, he'd be in Birmingham or Edinburgh. <laughs> Sue Nichols is Chris's older sister. She found it difficult growing up with his unpredictable behaviour, particularly because the family had no idea about the extent of his condition. He'd have behavioural problems, which in those days used to be throwing things. And another thing he used to do if he was bored and stressed was to spit, which is a peculiar thing, but he'd go up to the wall and spit and watch spit running down the wall. You'd have all these trails of spit everywhere. And like a lot of children with learning difficulties, he'd bang his head against the wall. That was very worrying. Once, when he was stressed, he went outside in a tantrum and emptied a skip. It was unbelievable. I didn't think he had the strength to do it. He'd lifted all the concrete blocks out and everything. Do you feel things might be different now, that he might be different now, if he'd had different treatment at that time, if the problem had been isolated? I think he might have had uh, fewer periods of terrible behavioural problems. We were always terribly worried he'd get into trouble with the police. It's estimated there are half a million people with autistic spectrum disorder in this country. We're getting better at diagnosing children, but many adults, like Chris, only find out later in life. Sometimes they're misdiagnosed with mental illness. The effect on families can be devastating. Nearly two-thirds of diagnosed adults find themselves financially dependent on parents, many still living at home. It's a miracle my parents stayed together, I think, because the stress of all this. Never being able to organise a family social life because you never knew what Chris's behaviour would be. He doesn't even now like a lot of people around. For those of us who are what autistics call NT, neurotypical, it can be difficult to understand the workings of the autistic brain. Hard even for professionals. Diagnosis is not an exact science. Misdiagnosis can have serious consequences. In my own family, we had to come to terms with a professional assessment that put one of our children on the autism scale. Not true, as it turned out, but the implications for the family were profound and the effect on early school years traumatic. People talk about low-functioning autism to high-functioning and then Asperger's syndrome, but a lot of that reflects IQ differences. One leading psychologist and writer who's devoted his career to research and diagnosis, particularly in adults, is Cambridge University professor Simon Baron cohen He's director of the Autism Research Centre there. You would define autism spectrum conditions as difficulties in social interaction, social relationships, difficulties with communication, and then these very narrow interests, sometimes called obsessions, and difficulty in reacting to change and needing to do things very repetitively. It probably is just a historical accident that we thought that autism was a childhood condition because the early accounts in the 1940s were all about children and obviously that whole generation have now grown up and we've realised it's a lifelong condition and there are other people who only get their diagnosis very late. Also called Chris, but at the high-functioning Asperger end of the condition, Chris Goodchild wasn't diagnosed until he was in his 40s. By then, he'd learned to adapt to what society expected of him. I draw pictures, and there's a picture here of me being in a closet. <laughs> I had to put all of my unusualness, my affectedness, my Aspie personality. Many of us like being called Aspies. 
short for Asperger syndrome. Those feelings of being mad, bad, crazy, deranged, I hid them away. And that door has been shut for, for 42 years. And what I presented to the world is a front to survive, to cope. Well, one thing we now all agree on is that autism and Asperger's syndrome are neurological. That's to say they are the result of atypical development of the brain. We didn't always realise that. In the bad old days, autism was thought to be purely psychological and maybe the reaction to inadequate parenting, which meant that parents often felt very much to blame. I was adopted when I was six weeks old. And my adoptive parents were quite obsessed with being normal. Having Asperger's syndrome is a gift. It's a gifted way of seeing the world, but it can also be a painful gift. We feel life with great intensity, see, feel, touch, taste. Life can easily become overwhelming. So our senses are very finely tuned. And that's why often we find eye contact difficult. We find light difficult, movement difficult, smells. All of our senses can be very stimulated. I'm Selina, spending 30-odd years wondering what was wrong with me. Selina was also diagnosed late in life, in her 50s. I'd been put on Prozac, ostensibly for an eating disorder. And indeed, before that, I'd been at the eating disorders clinic. My considerable weight has some very positive functions for me in that it kind of keeps me grounded on the planet. One of the aspects of my autism is a tendency to just drift away off into a dream, and that can be very frightening. The picture of what's going on in the brain is quite complicated. It is the result of using MRI scanning, so magnetic resonance imaging, and that can be structural MRI, where you get a snapshot of different structures in the brain, or it can be functional MRI, where you get dynamic information, how the brain is actually working whilst the person is doing a task. You can see that the autistic brain, for want of a better word, is working very differently and developing very differently to the typical brain, whether you're looking at total volume or size, or whether you're looking at the way individual nerve cells are connecting together and the number of nerve cells. And all of that will have an impact on the psychology of the person, how they perceive the world. So, for example, it's thought that an increased number of nerve cells may mean the person is picking up much more information than the average person. As average people, neurotypicals, we relate to our surroundings and others in an entirely different way. Just for a moment, though, imagine what it's like inside the hypersensitive autistic mind, overwhelmed by stimuli and voices. Most people with Asperger's syndrome have what's known as auditory dysfunction difficulties. The autistic brain has a very poor filtering system. Because I was awfully slow. I was awfully slow. We can get bombarded with and, stimulation um, and information. They'd like tell me a joke outside the classroom. As a result of that, can become easy. And then just repeat a tiny bit of it when we're in the classroom, and, and then I would quite difficult for people to understand the that people with high functioning autism can look visually very unaffected. Asperger syndrome and is actually internally a they're deeply distressed. Large Far from gardens, being in the room, so I feel it's um, it's a gift. To scream, you want to shout. But what uh, I lose most on. of us don't scream and shout, we just scream and shout. And, and down there we have a summer house, uh, which again, actually, that is for one particular all of the other people in the house. So, summertime particularly, she's able to go down there and sit quietly uh, without being disturbed. <laughs> 